Hey y'all, this is Justin again, checking in from Middle Tennessee, and today I want to talk about some blood tests. Now, today I'm taking a little different approach, because I want to talk about some blood tests that are non-TRT related per se. And if you're wondering why I want to do that and make that diversion, is because most patients, at least on mine, most patients that see us that are on TRT or peptide therapy, are those who want longevity. They want to feel better, they want to look better, they want to perform better, and overall they just want a better sense of well-being. So that brings us to a good segue, and the first test I want to talk about is called the Omega Index Blood Test. Okay, the Omega-3 Index Blood Test. So just like some people, particularly diabetics or those who are insulin resistant, will have what's called a hemoglobin A1C, every three-ish months. The omega-3 index is also a test that you can have that reflects the omega-3 values, namely the EPA and DHA status of your red blood cells over the last three-ish months. Now, red blood cells have a lifespan of roughly 90 to 120-ish days, hence three to four months. Thus, when you look at the omega-3 index, or if you look at the hemoglobin A1C, what you're seeing is reflective of that lifespan of the red blood cell, which again is roughly about three months. Next part I wanna talk about is the target that you wanna shoot for on your blood values. So target goal of the omega-3 index is considered to be 8% or higher. 8% or higher is considered to be cardioprotective whereas being 4% or lower is considered to be a cardiovascular risk factor. So in fact, having a high omega-3 index is considered to be more predictive of reducing cardiovascular risk versus having a very low C-reactive protein high sensitivity value. And speaking of C-reactive protein high sensitivity, that's another test I'll talk about in this section. We'll just focus on that later. Again, these are all biomarkers used to stratify risk. They're not definitive, but they're used to help you mitigate risk and make lifestyle decisions based on what you can find here. Let's talk about why omega-3s are considered to be cardioprotective. Now, the first primary mechanism of action that omega-3s exert, now there's, there's numerous amounts, but this is the first big major mechanism of action, is that they suppress the activity of an enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase. Now, hormone-sensitive lipase's big function is to mobilize fatty acids. And well, if you're suppressing hormone-sensitive lipase, you're not mobilizing these fatty acids, and thus you're not releasing them into the bloodstream. By reducing it, you're actually having a net reduction in very low-density lipoproteins, aka VLDLs, and triglycerides as well. And the next, primary mechanism of action of omega-3s are that they upregulate the activity of what's called the retinoid X receptor or RXR for short and that increases the activity of an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase's main primary function is the breakdown of triglycerides. So between hormone sensitive lipase being suppressed which suppresses the release of fatty acids into the bloodstream. Meanwhile, lipoprotein lipase is increasing the breakdown of trigs. You can see how omega-3s can be implicated in cardiometabolic health. Again, the goal is achieving about greater than 8% of your omega-3 status of your red blood cells. So let's move on to the next section. Now the second unconventional health biomarker that would be wise to obtain is called the C-reactive protein high sensitivity, or CRPHS for short. Now, C-reactive protein is an acute phase reactant. This means that typically during witnesses or you'll witness excursions in times of illness, uh, injury, high levels of stress, um, inflammation, that's what we refer to as something that's an acute phase reactant. However, right now I'm going to focus primarily on C-reactive protein high sensitivity. So what's the difference between the traditional CRP and the CRPHS? Well, technically they're the same protein. They're both produced by the liver, 
Um, they both peak around two days and they both have a half-life of roughly one week. But there's two primary differences. The first difference is that the C-reactive protein high sensitivity test will identify and detect trace levels of CRP. In other words, it can, it can detect much smaller levels from the blood than the traditional CRP standard test can. And the second primary difference is that the CRP high sensitivity test is often used to detect low levels of inflammation of atherosclerosis. So in the context of patients that have known coronary artery disease or they have known ASCVD, known atherosclerotic disease, or in the context of those patients that have comorbidities that put them at risk for such conditions, getting the CRP high sensitivity test would be of greater value. There's even some literature that purports that values greater than three with those given contexts that measured can be somewhat predictive of someone actually having a cardiovascular event at some point in their life. Now, I just mentioned that in the context of someone having some known cardiovascular disease or ASCVD, which means it's an acronym for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, that numbers greater than three could be somewhat predictive of having a cardiovascular event. So here's a scenario. Let's say hypothetically you get yours drawn and it's an eight or nine or a 10. Uh, much of the literature supports that that's most likely an acute phase reactant. Now, what I would recommend is waiting two-ish weeks, two to three weeks, redraw it again. If it's gone back down, then you know it's an acute phase reactant. But let's say hypothetically, you do have some comorbidities or some known cardiovascular disease, and it's chronically a three, a five, a four, a four, a three then that's more likely to be indicative of chronic um, active vascular inflammation. Again, this is just another test to help you stratify risk. Um, simply because it's over three does not mean you're gonna have a heart attack or an event. Take into context with your, your personal history, your family history, um, your comorbidities, et cetera, et cetera, and your lifestyle. And final test I wanna talk about today is referred to as a methylene tetrahydrofolic reductase test, or we'll refer to it as MTHFR for short because that's the acronym it goes for. Now, this is actually a somewhat common genetic variant mutation and it affects roughly about 30% of our population. And what it does is it's a defect in the gene for the MTHFR enzyme, and that enzyme is responsible for converting folic acid into folate. Folic acid is B9. To put it simply, having this mutation essentially means that your body cannot efficiently convert B9 into active B9. Depending on your mutation, you may lack the ability to convert a fraction of the folic acid. You may uh, lack the ability to convert a large, robust amount of the folic acid. Now, that's not to say that if you do in fact have this mutation that you can't convert folic acid into folate, there's a probability that you still can into a, a marginal degree, but the degree in efficiency is significantly reduced. Actually, depending on which variant you have of the gene and depending on whether or not you are heterozygous or homozygous uh, for the genetic mutation, it's speculated that the efficiency of conversion is somewhat reduced around 30 to 65% reduction. Let's talk about some possible consequences of having this gene mutation. So besides the inability to convert folic acid into active folate, it can also lead to an accumulation of folic acid as well. And the big difference between folic acid and folate is that folate is considered the natural form and folic acid is considered the synthetic form. Folic acid is typically what you find in like fortified grains and cereals. Um, furthermore, folate crosses the blood-brain barrier, whereas folic acid, it really doesn't have the capability. Also, another major consequence of having this MTHFR gene mutation is what's called as hyperhomocysteinemia, which translates to having high homocysteine levels and homocysteine is an amino acid formed from the conversion of methionine to cysteine. And this brings us here to how MTHFR ties into this. 
this gene mutation is considered the most common cause of high homocysteine levels. And high homocysteine levels have been associated with cardiovascular disease. Now, simply having high homocysteine doesn't mean you're going to develop cardiovascular disease, but it puts you at a propensity that you may. Also, folate is a cofactor in the, the development of um, melatonin, serotonin, dopamine, um, neurotransmitters such as those. So being deficient in that and having this gene mutation can put you at increased risk of ADHD, insomnia, OCD, anxiety. Um, lastly and furthermore, it can also affect your ability to detox via the liver's pathways and it can also reduce your ability to produce glutathione, which is considered a major detoxification antioxidant in the body. So appreciate you watching. And again, these aren't TRT blood tests per se, but they are definitely tests for those who are seeking longevity and the anti-aging side of integrated medicine and hormone replacement. <music>